For our purposes today, uh, I want us to do uh, kind of four character studies as these two chapters unfold. So we're going to look at the same events in 1 Samuel 19 and 20 uh, from different perspectives. So we're going to look at Saul first, Jonathan, David, and then lastly, God. So that's kind of where we're going this morning. So let's look at, uh, first let's look at Saul. By this point, uh, by the time we get to chapter 19, Saul has a pretty good track record of doing what is right in his own eyes, no matter what the cost. From offering sacrifices to making incredibly rash vows to treating God like a good luck charm. And last week we saw Saul's jealousy reach its peak or reach a tipping point as he realized uh, the scriptures say that the Lord was with David. And so Saul makes multiple attempts, not only one, but multiple attempts to kill David with a spear. I don't know why Saul's always like carrying a spear around. We'll see it in this chapter as well. Anyways, um, Proverbs 14, 35 says, a king delights in a wise servant but a shameful servant incurs his wrath. And that, that Hebrew word translated wise in that proverb is the same word 
that is used to talk and describe David's successes. Right? David is, Saul's killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. There were Philistines, and David drove them out. All of these things that are successes that have brought, if you, if you would say that they've brought varied and even inconsistent responses from Saul, which goes to show just how far Saul is continuing to careen off of what God intended for him as king. Saul's wise and successful servant David is not the object of his delight, but is actually the object of his murderous intent. Let's look at verses 1, and then we'll jump over and read 9 through 17. So 1 Samuel 19, verse 1. And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Jump over to verse 9. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. But he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear in the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. Michael took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with cloths. And when, and when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed, with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? So if we see anything from these verses, we see that Saul is committed to his purpose of doing away with David. Right? Much like the Pharaoh in the story of Exodus, Saul is driven to desperate measures and will stop at nothing in his pride to get the outcome that he wants. To the point where he creates conflicts of loyalty with his own children. Right? He tries to pin David to the wall again with the spear. He sends messengers to David's house at night so that when David wakes up in the morning, he can't escape. They've cornered him. In verses 11 through 17, we see that Michael, David's wife, who Saul originally put as a stumbling block in David's path, actually rescues him. So Saul's plan is entirely backfiring because his own children are actually coming to David's aid. So that's chapter 19. Those are a couple instances that we see of Saul. Let's jump over to chapter 20 and let's read uh, 20 through, uh, 24 through 33. So David hid himself in the field. David is, is running from Saul at this point. So David hid himself in the field and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat as at other times, on the seat by the wall, and Jonathan sat opposite. And Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. But on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, 
he has not come to the king's table. Verse 30, then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? 33, but Saul hurled his spear at him to make, to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. So David would miss this feast, not only, uh, so Saul would miss David at this feast, not only because his, just, his seat was empty, but because it was normal in that uh, time and in that culture for if you served under a king in any capacity, especially as some sort of leading military commander, you being at important meals uh, showed your loyalty and your support to that king. And so David's absence undoubtedly would have raised a question in Saul's mind about David's commitment to him. Again, Saul is concerned primarily about how the line of events in his life make him look and affect him. So Saul concludes that at the first time that David hadn't come to the new moon kind of sacrificial meal because he was unclean, they were under like the Levitical law, as we see in Leviticus 7, where they were very focused on purity and meals and all of those things. But his continued absence on the second day, that requires an explanation, which Saul looks to David's friend and his son, Jonathan, to provide. I thought it was interesting that if you look closely at uh, 19, chapters 19 and 20, uh, Saul doesn't uh, use David's name. He's at the point where he either calls him my enemy or the son of Jesse. So David hates, Saul hates David so much that he cannot even bring himself to use his name. And then by, uh, Saul takes the insult even further by insulting Jonathan's mother, his wife. As, and as I said a, a few weeks ago, pride is a deadly vice. And we've seen Saul exhibit that time and time and time again. Pride has so twisted his view of things that he's even turning against his own family. And people that could aid him if he would just see reason and come under what God was doing. The novelist Marilyn uh, Robinson says, pride is often the veil that blinds us not only to our own faults, but also to the humanity of others. So that's Saul, dominated by pride on this wild streak of trying to, to kill David, and he will go to whatever lengths he has to to accomplish that. So that's Saul. Let's look at Jonathan. We're, uh, we're first introduced to uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, back in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And then last week, we took a look at Jonathan's uh, close friendship with David. And I think in chapters 19 and 20, we, we get to see that explored in some pretty deep ways. Let's look at 1 Samuel 19, verses 1 through 7. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you. 
and because his deeds have brought great good to you. For he took his life in his own hand and struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin, Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. So right out of the gate, we see that Jonathan is in a pretty tough spot. Right? He's having to make an appeal to his own father not to kill his best friend. It's a little awkward. Right? Jonathan's appeal was successful, at least temporarily, and resulted in Saul solemnly swearing a vow before the Lord not to kill David. And in, in keeping, again, with his character, Saul broke, breaks that vow shortly. Nevertheless, this, this time his appeal resulted in David's restoration, not only to the court, but continuing service of the king. And as I was reading, and we'll get more into it in a second, but as I was reading about Jonathan and David's friendship, I really admired it. Because I think it's pretty rare. I've had very few people throughout my life up to this point that I could say, as the scriptures say about Jonathan and David, that they loved each other as they loved their own soul. Having 500 friends on social media is not the same thing as feeling a deep sense of recognition and belonging from someone you're sitting across the table from or on a road trip with or what have you. I love what Darren said last week about how we all long for those type of friends, right? Who doesn't? But God also calls us to be that type of friend to other people. It's what the philosopher and poet John O'Donohue calls a soul friend, someone who sees the deep things in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they still choose to stay. Now, I don't think you should be that way with everybody. There's tons of data to, data to back up the fact that uh, what a person can hold that kind of friend space for is usually about three to five people. So I'm not, like, don't, like, you shouldn't go out and, like, try to be everybody's, like, best friend and, like, spill all your secrets. Like, there's a point where that can become unhealthy. But you need people in your life that, that care about you, that are not all that impressed with you, and that love you and choose to stay. Right? And that takes time to build. And I think Jonathan and David, they really exemplify that in these two chapters. Let's flip over to uh, chapter 20 now and read verses uh, 1 through 4. Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? Is it not so? Verse 3, but David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes, and he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as your own soul lives, there is a, there is a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Let's jump over uh, to 16. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the, Lord take, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. 
So this chapter records Jonathan's last attempt to reconcile Saul and David, try to work out this very complicated relationship. Jonathan appealed to the Lord in an oath, uh, indicating the, the seriousness of the situation. Like, hey, this isn't something that we're just doing tritely or haphazardly. We want the Lord to be involved, like more deeply involved in this as far as how we interact with it. He prayed that God would be with David as he had been with Saul, namely as, as Israel's king. And I think we see from these verses that they indicate clearly that Jonathan believed that David would someday be king. And not only that he would be king, but that he would subdue his enemies, including Saul. Jonathan had come to appreciate God's faithfulness. And now he's calling on David to deal sim similarly with his descendants in the future. To make a covenant with somebody's house, that's what that meant. Like that included lineage. So he secures a promise from David that when he reigned, he would protect Jonathan's family. That Hebrew word uh, is used of, of God. It's called hesed, which is literally translated faithfulness and loyalty. So Jonathan is asking David, be faithful and loyal like our God is. It's a covenant term of commitment, which David years later will fulfill with Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. It was common in the ancient Near East for kings who began a new dynasty or a new like ruler was coming on the scene. They would come in and they would wipe out all the descendants of the former king in order to keep them from rising up and trying to reclaim the throne. So Jonathan calls on God to require an accounting for all of the antagonism at the hands of David's enemies. We see that in verse 16. And so there's all of these, like, like it can be a little confusing. There's all these vows going on and all, like, inviting the Lord into this, but... At the end of all of that together, they devise a plan to see whether or not David can return or if he should flee for his life. Let's look at 20, uh, 18 through 23. Then Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon. You will be missed because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of you, to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send the boy, saying, Go find the arrows. If I say to the boy, Look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them. Then you, then you may come, for as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, Look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter for which you for which I you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. Later after this moment, we'll see Jonathan and his father gathered around a table. Jonathan now is on the receiving end not only of his father's verbal insults, but also his physical assaults as well. Verse 31, Saul says, For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger, and ate no food the second day of the feast, the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. So Jonathan goes out into the field where David is now hiding, and he shoots the arrows beyond David, signaling that it's not safe for David to come back. And then we get verse 42, chapter 20, verse 42. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because you have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between you and me and between our offspring and your offspring forever. 
And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Jonathan has clearly made his choice. And what we see from Scripture is that Jonathan's ambitions are in stark contrast to his father's. Right? Jonathan wanted God's plans to succeed more than he wanted to be king. Because he would have been next in line, if not for David. Jonathan faced a terrible tension since Saul's attitude divided his loyalty. Right? He's got this tension of like, do I honor the current person in power who happens to be my blood? Or do I trust in my friend and more so in God of what God has said about a friend that I love with like my own soul? Jonathan solved this dilemma, at least internally for himself, by putting God's will first. He makes constant references, again, about vows and calling on the name of the Lord. He's telling himself a different story than what Saul is telling. While he submitted, so John, while Jonathan submitted to kind of the domestic authority of his father and to, and to Saul's civil authority as king... Jonathan only did that up to the point where obedience to Saul conflicted with obedience to God. Jonathan was loyal to the bigger story that God was telling, which leads us to David. David is, has all of his continuing success. Right? And wh while in the meantime, the, the thing that is constantly at odds with David's successes is Saul's jealousy. Let's look at 19 verses 8 through 10. How's everybody doing? We good? One person said they were fine. Great. 19. 19. 19 verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul, so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. From now on, David was no longer able to stay in Saul's presence. It was literally not safe for him. So he flees and he escapes, <coughs> excuse me, seeking refuge from the king wherever he can find it. Right, from this point on, for at least 10 years, David will live out his days as a fugitive, constantly trying to live beyond Saul's reach, which again begins here and will continue until Saul's death. Throughout chapter 19, we see David constantly avoiding Saul's attempts to capture and to kill him. Not only, uh, not only regarding Jonathan, it's kind of Jonathan's kind of helping him navigate this, but also with Michael, David's wife. We saw that even she is trying to protect David and creating diversions for him to escape. David eventually finds himself in uh, Naoth in Ramah, where Samuel is. Samuel has kind of started this uh, school, if you will, of, of prophetic ministry, and that's where David finds himself. And he tells Samuel all that Saul has done to him. And then in chapter 20, David is obviously concerned for his own safety. Right? We read that in verse 1. It says, Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So David and Jonathan propose this plan where David will hide in a field for three days, which causes him to miss the meal that Saul tries to kill Jonathan at. And so David proposes this test to, to try to convince Jonathan that Saul is really really intends to kill him. And after the meal, where Jonathan 
leaves after almost getting killed, Jonathan's like, okay, now I, now I know that there is no reconciling that is going to happen here. And David will even go as far as to ask Jonathan that if he must die, rather than allowing Saul to do it, that Jonathan should do it. David wanted to die. If he was going to die, he wanted to die at the hand of his friend rather than at the hand of his enemy. And Jonathan obviously refuses to do that. And so, as we've seen already, David misses this meal and finds himself hiding in a field. This is God's anointed. This is the next leader that God has appointed for God's people, and he's hiding in a, amongst a pile of rocks, waiting for his closest friend and a little boy and a couple of arrows. Like, this is how, this is how God gets things done. This is how God lets people know what is going on and leads them. Like, what, what is going on? And as David sits or kneels and hides in this field, he, he hears the words that I'm sure made his heart sink to the bottom of his feet. Jonathan asks the boy, is not the arrow beyond you? You see, verse 39 tells us that only Jonathan and David knew what was going on. And the Lord was sending David away. David knows, without a doubt now, that he can't come back, at least not for a very long time. Let's read verses 41 through 42 in chapter 20. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. This is the last time that these friends will see each other, this side of eternity. We won't get there until chapter 31 of 1 Samuel, but at the battle of Mount Goboa, Jonathan will die alongside his father Saul. And 2 Samuel opens with David grieving the loss of his friend, and even of Saul. So the question that, that we have to ask, or that we have to look at, is what? does this tell us about God? We focused on a couple different characters in the story, but ultimately the, the, the author and the main person, the hero, is not David or Jonathan or Michael, but it's God. So let's take it kind of one by one. In the midst of Saul's pride and Jonathan's loyalties and David's fears, Right, what we see about God is that he is wise, he is powerful, and that he is near. I left out some things on purpose in Saul's story. Let's uh, go back to 19, uh, and let's read verses 20 through 24. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing at its head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again a third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Siku, and he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Naoth in Ramah. And he went there to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and lay naked all that day and that night. That it was said, 
Is Saul also among the prophets? What in the world is God doing? God rescues David, not by any intermediary, but directly by the overpowering influence of his spirit. Saul's three groups of messengers, and even Saul himself, ended up serving God rather than opposing him. The Holy Spirit overrode Saul's authority. Now, when it says they, they prophesied, that's, uh, that's in a different context than, say, when Paul is talking about the gift of prophecy, which is for the edification of the church in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Here, it literally means they just started praising God. In the midst of trying to usurp and destroy God's plan, the Holy Spirit overrides it, and they actually end up praising God. And even with Jonathan, we see him call on God to be a witness regarding his and David's oaths. God, to be with David, whatever happens. And the last words that Jonathan ever says to his friends is, the Lord shall be between me and you and between our offspring and between my offspring and your offspring forever. There's a constant, uh, again, there's a story in Jonathan's mind that is, is forming him into the type of person that can, know, that can say no matter what happens, God is, in, God is in this and he's in between you and I and what is going on. And then in David, God is all-knowing and near to David. Now, David doesn't know what's going on, but God does. And as David comes into alignment with God, he gets to a point where he, ate, where he's, where he writes Psalm 59, the ending of which Larry read for us, Psalm 59, 16 through 17, but I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Now that doesn't mean that it was easy. We're going to see that. Trusting God is, is hard sometimes. But I want to leave us with a, with a question in light of everything that we've read this morning. And it's, just a, it's, the, it's the question of will we trust him? Will we trust him? Not can we. That question has been answered most assuredly in Jesus. But will we trust him? in the midst of the highs and the lows when we're, it seems like we're growing in every area and it, at times when we feel like our lives are falling apart. Right? It's very easy to, to, to trust God when, when you're in a church on Sunday and things are going great and you just, you know, really nothing is going on. It's, it's a lot harder to trust God when you don't know how this situation is going to turn out. You don't, you know, you prayed for something and it, and it didn't happen the way that you wanted to. I had a, a mentor uh, tell a story of, of another woman that he knew who had prayed uh, to God for years to have a baby. And it just wasn't happening. And then they, they, were, they were moving into a new apartment, her and her husband, in the city. And she, uh, they needed a microwave. And she prayed for a microwave. She's like, God, I need you to provide me a microwave. That was in the afternoon. And then at night, they were serving food to the homeless. And this van pulls up out of nowhere. And the guy opens the door and says, hey, we're from an appliance store. And we've got some extra, like revenue that we didn't plan on, does anybody want a microwave? And this lady rejoiced. It's like, yes, God provides. He provided me a microwave, and then it hit her. God, I asked for a microwave one time, 
and I have asked for a baby for years, and I have gotten seemingly nothing but silence. Like, what do you do with that? The great pastor Charles Spurgeon once said, when you can't see God's hand, trust his heart. When you can't see his hand, trust his heart. Because the truth about God, the truth about Jesus, is not only that he saved us and like now we're good, but that he's actually helping us. Right? That he's interceding for us on our behalf. That he's interceding for us, that he's constantly doing things in big and small ways throughout our day, through that, through the hand on your shoulder by a trusted friend, from that smile from the person that you love, from a movie you watch, from a book you read, in the way that like nature tells about the glory of God, he's constantly trying to befriend you. <laughs> that God not only loves you, but actually likes you as well. Or in the words of Jesus, that, that at the bedrock of who he is, says that he is gentle and lowly in heart. The writer Dane Ortland, in his book, Deeper, writes, what we must see, what we must see is not only that Jesus is gentle toward us, but that he is positively drawn to us when we are most sure that he doesn't want to be. And what is that for you? Like what area in your life, what area in your life have you just, let's just be honest, have you stopped believing wholeheartedly that God can move in? I've got them. <laughs> What is that for you? Because the question underneath that question is, will you trust him? Will you trust him? And will you believe that he is positively drawn to you and to you in the areas of your life where you think that, by judging by the way my life is going, God doesn't seem to care about that. That he, that's the place that he actually wants to meet you in that addictive sin pattern, in that thing that you can't get over, in that relationship that won't get reconciled, in that thing in your life that won't, just won't happen, that that's not a barrier to you experiencing God. That itself is an invitation where God has set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Or in the words of Paul, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul will say later that if when we were God's enemies and he came and he died, how much now more will he not give us all things? And so we're invited this morning to be reminded again and to walk out of here with, with new eyes and, and a, hopefully a fresh perspective of the fact that God is near and that he cares and he wants to, to draw near to us in the places that, that we're afraid of. 